Welcome to the Birchler Lab, Fluorescence in Situ Hybridization, commonly referred to by its acronym FISH, is an amazing and powerful cytogenetic technique. For the purpose of this tutorial, FISH methodology will be limited to the hybridization of labeled DNA sequences to chromosomal DNA. FISH has been used in a wide range of research applications from chromosome identification to genetic engineering as illustrated by the following group of images. An example of chromosome identification is shown in this karyotype of maize inbred line H99. Each chromosome pair has a unique pattern of fluorescent signals. The pattern for each line is different and can be viewed as the plant version of a fingerprint. Fish can also be used to localize endogenous genes. The probe for the maize SUS1 gene was generated from two cloned fragments totaling about 7 kb. This particular gene is located on the long arm of chromosome 9 as shown by the magenta signals. Combining single gene detection with chromosome identification probes allows one to position a gene to a chromosomal region. The maize genome contains several families of transposable elements, three of which are shown. The insertion sites are numerous and line-specific, an advantage if you're interested in studying transposable elements. However, for most of us, they are to be avoided when it comes to selecting sequences for fish probes. The same can be said of retroelement sequences, unless, for example, they're used for genome karyotyping of allopolyploids, plants whose genomes come from two or more different species. The chromosomes derived from each parental lineage in this trihybrid are visible as three different colors. FISH has also been used to identify the positions of nuclear inserted mitochondrial DNA. Unique insertion patterns were observed even among different sources of the same maze line. FISH can be used to identify maternally and paternally derived chromosomes in the F1 if the parental hybridization patterns are sufficiently different. Three such examples are indicated using mitochondrial DNA insertions. When it comes to genetic engineering, FISH is a very helpful tool. It can be used to show the presence and location of an engineered construct in the original transformed plant and follow the construct through subsequent crosses. FISH can also be used to identify truncated chromosomes that can later be used as platforms on which to introduce engineered constructs. Now that you've seen some examples of how FISH can be used, let's look at the method itself. The FISH process is somewhat analogous to a southern hybridization. Although different types of DNA can be used to make FISH probes, the use of cloned DNA is illustrated. Probe template DNA is amplified using PCR. After purification, the DNA is labeled in a NIC translation reaction. During NIC translation, DNase 1 randomly NICs either one of the two strands. At these breaks, DNA polymerase 1 performs two functions. The exonuclease activity makes a gap in the broken strand, which the polymerase activity fills with newly synthesized DNA. Fluorescently labeled DNTPs are incorporated directly into the new strand, thus making the probe. Denatured probe strands are then hybridized to chromosomal DNA and the signal is digitally imaged. The goals of this video are to illustrate our basic procedures and provide helpful hints. Although the procedures and images shown are for maize, the techniques have been used successfully in a number of plant species. Today's emphasis will be on using probes made from high copy number repetitive sequence clusters or ribosomal RNA genes. Given the time constraints, it's assumed that the viewer has experience with standard molecular biology techniques, has knowledge of basic laboratory safety, and is aware of hazardous material disposal regulations. Recipes and additional detail can be found in two companion resources, the Karyotyping and Fish Manual, and the May's Somatic Chromosome Painting article in PNAS. The remainder of this video is organized into modules covering each of the pertinent steps in the FISH process. Please pause the video to read the tips and helpful hints presented at the end of each section. 
The protocols presented here are by no means the only way to do fish, but are simpler than many methods. Please regard the protocols as guidelines with a considerable amount of flexibility at most steps. In fact, no two people, even in our lab, do fish exactly the same way. So adapt the protocols to fit your species, applications and goals, and most of all, have fun. Making a good probe is essential for getting a good fish image. Please carefully consider the basics of probe design before ordering primers. It will be time well spent. Included in probe design is deciding how many probes are needed. The number depends on your objectives. If your objective is what we call a full cocktail karyotype, 10 to 12 probes will be needed to paint the chromosomes. However, most of the time it's possible to identify all 20 metaphase chromosomes with just two probes plus DAPI, a DNA counter stain used to identify regions of maize heterochromatin. If your objective is to identify a specific chromosome or confirm the presence of a particular target sequence, a single probe is probably sufficient. The most important aspects of probe design, and therefore the most time-consuming, are selecting the sequence and its length. First, let's look at sequence composition. The critical factor in probe sequence selection is homology to the target. To avoid unwanted fish signals, the sequence must be target-specific. Avoid clustered repeats. Use available database tools to aid in this endeavor. To avoid repeats or if more sequence is needed, the probe can be made by combining several non-contiguous sequences in the region of interest. Two factors come into play when deciding how long the probe sequence should be. Target size and fluorochrome choice. Smaller target sizes require brighter fluorochromes and a longer probe sequence to be visible using fish. Target size is defined as the amount of chromosome available for probe hybridization, that is, probe length times the number of copies of probe sequence on the chromosome. Because red fluorochromes are intrinsically brighter, they can be used to label successfully not only large targets, but are the first choice for the smallest ones, as indicated by the smallest full color circle in the diagram. Green works well for all except the smallest targets, whereas blue and far red are most often reserved for larger targets. When labeling large targets, there is more flexibility in probe design. Choose the fluorochrome that best suits your objective. Depending on the method of probe labeling, the sequence length can range from about 25 nucleotides to 1 kb or longer. To summarize, when designing a probe, remember target specificity and don't try to visualize the smallest target possible. Keep the target size above 2.5 kb for red probes and 6 kb for green. If you plan to label smaller targets with blue or far red, some experimentation is necessary. If you need additional colors to distinguish multiple targets, independent samples of the same DNA sequence can be labeled separately with different fluorochromes and hybridized together along with any other probes. Probe signal strength and specificity can be evaluated only by hybridization to chromosomes. Even carefully designed probes aren't always target specific. This red probe looked good at first glance, but on closer inspection was found also to have homology to knob heterochromatin. The probe was subsequently redesigned to eliminate the sequence responsible for the nonspecific signals. A probe troubleshooting guide is included at the end of this module. Now that you're an expert in design, let's go make a probe. NIC translation is used to incorporate a fluorescently labeled DNTP directly into the newly synthesized probe DNA. After calculating the volume of template DNA needed, the necessary components are assembled on ice. The components are mixed by pipetting up and down as vortexing is too harsh for the enzymes in the reaction. 
The tube is transferred to a thermocycler set to 15 degrees Celsius for two hours. Afterwards, the reaction can be cleaned immediately by column purification or stored in the dark at negative 20 degrees Celsius for later use. Following Nick translation, probes must be purified before they can be used in the fish procedure. While green and blue probes can be purified with only an ethanol precipitation, red and far red probes must be purified with column purification to remove unincorporated DNTPs. The column is prepared by first removing a small amount of silane treated glass wool and placing it carefully in the top of a pasture pipette. The handle from an aluminum inoculating loop is then used to tamp the wool into position at the bottom. The work is performed over paper towels to collect any stray glass fibers which could be harmful if handled or inhaled. The column matrix is a slurry of TE hydrated biogel P60 which has been stored at 4 degrees Celsius. The slurry is gently stirred to create a lower bead concentration at the top of the mixture. Gel from this region is used to start filling the column, after which a more concentrated portion can be used. Starting with a low concentration of gel helps to avoid trapping pockets of air in the bottom of the column. Air pockets at the top of the column can sometimes be removed with a pipette. The column is quickly moved up and down to begin the flow of TE, then placed into a 1.7 milliliter tube. The column is allowed to drain, and the excess TE is periodically removed from the tube. Additional biogel is added to the column until the gel height is about 3 mm above the pipette constriction. The Nick translation reaction mixture is carefully added to the top of the matrix with a pipette and covered to protect from light. After one minute, 50 microliters of TE is added to the top of the column and allowed to enter the gel. 350 microliters of TE is added to the column and allowed to drain. At this point, the column is inspected to ensure that the probe can be visibly identified as moving through the matrix. The column is then moved to the first of three 1.7 milliliter tubes for elution. 350 microliters of TE is added to the column and the flow through is collected. Wait until there is no TE visible at the top of the gel matrix before moving the column to a new collection tube. This process is repeated two more times. The column is then examined under UV light to ensure proper function. Unincorporated DNTPs are trapped in the center of the column, while incorporated DNTPs pass through the column and into the collection tubes. Red probes can now be purified by ethanol precipitation alongside blue and green probes. One tenth volume of three molar sodium acetate and two and a half volumes of 100% ethanol are added and mixed with the probe. Additionally, sheared salmon sperm DNA is added to the mixture to act as a carrier. Green and blue probes are first brought to a total volume of 100 microliters with TE before ethanol precipitation. The mixture is vortexed thoroughly before being placed at negative 20 degrees Celsius overnight. The DNA is pelleted the next morning by centrifuging for 30 minutes at 16,000 Gs. The tubes are examined following centrifugation to check for proper pellet formation. The tubes from a column purification should show more DNA present in the first elution than the second or third. If no visible color can be observed in the third tube, it may be discarded. It is helpful to examine tubes under UV light, as it is easier to visualize the pellets and their intensities. DNA frequently adheres to the side of the tube. This issue is addressed later in the video. The pellets are rinsed twice with 70% ethanol, with care taken to not lose the pellet. After the final rinse, the tubes are inverted to drain, and the rims blotted. Residual ethanol is teased out of the tube with an unfiltered 200 microliter pipette tip. The pellets are not allowed to fully dry, as they will be difficult to resuspend. 
The pellets are resuspended in 2XSSC, 1XTE, in a volume related to the amount of DNA in the Nick translation reaction. For probes purified with column purification, this volume is distributed amongst the tubes. Resuspension is easier if tubes containing more probe receive a greater percentage of the volume. After the probe DNA is dissolved, the volumes are combined into one tube, which by convention is said to have a concentration of 200 nanograms per microliter. Probes are stored at negative 20 degrees Celsius until they can be used. Seeds can be germinated in a variety of media, peat-based, vermiculite, or on moist chem wipes or paper towels in a tackle box. Seeds are germinated in a growth chamber a few days before starting the fish method. To perform the fish procedure, root cell division must be stopped at metaphase. To accomplish this, roots are subjected to high pressure nitrous oxide for several hours. Roots need to be placed in a suitable environment during the treatment. To begin, 0.6 mil tubes are labeled and a hole punched in the top with forceps. Tubes are then sprayed with a fine mist of purified water in order to maintain high humidity during the nitrous oxide treatment. Germinated seeds are individually removed from the growth chamber and the roots inspected. Good roots, like those shown, are free of any root hairs and the root tip is an opaque yellow color. A sharp blade is used to cut off about 1.5 centimeters of the primary root tip, which is then transferred to a prepared tube. The tubes are then placed in a pressure safe chamber and tightly sealed. The chamber is then filled with nitrous oxide and the roots are treated for one to three hours. It is not necessary to purge the existing air in the chamber when adding nitrous oxide. After venting the nitrous oxide in a hood, the lid is removed and the tubes are opened and placed on ice. Pre-chilled acetic acid is quickly added to the roots to keep the cells in metaphase. Enough fixative is added to cover the roots and the tubes are left on ice for 10 minutes. After fixation, the acetic acid is removed with a pipette and replaced with 70% ethanol. Finally, Roots are moved to a fresh tube containing 70% ethanol and can be stored for months at negative 20 degrees Celsius. Root tips must be digested to remove the cell walls and release the chromosomes from the cells. Root tips are first rehydrated in water or buffer for 10 to 30 minutes to remove the ethanol. The time used to soak is dependent on how long the roots were stored, with longer storage time requiring a longer rehydration time. The amount of time required for soaking can often be judged by observing the roots in solution. Once rehydrated, the roots will sink to the bottom of the tube. While the roots are soaking, tubes of enzyme are removed from the freezer and placed on ice to thaw. To process roots, they are first rubbed towards the distal end to remove the protective viscous layer from the root cap. On most roots, a sharp blade is then used to remove a small section of the root cap, with care taken not to remove the meristem. This increases the surface area exposed to the enzyme. The root cap is left intact on thin roots to prevent over-digestion. 0.75 to 1 millimeter of meristem tissue is removed with a sharp blade. 
All cuts should be made perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the root. The root can be measured either with a ruler or a prepared template. The root meristem is then transferred into the enzyme solution and the tube placed on ice. After all samples have been collected, the tubes are placed in a 37 degrees Celsius water bath for 45 to 60 minutes. The amount of time required for digestion varies and needs to be determined empirically. Some factors to consider include genetic lineage, whether the root came from a seed or a plant, its size, and how long it was stored in ethanol. After digestion, tubes are placed on ice and filled with 70% ethanol. Care must be taken, as the roots are now fragile. Tubes are gently inverted to mix. The ethanol is then removed by either carefully pouring or pipetting. Fresh ethanol is then added to remove residual enzyme. This rinse may be repeated once more. After the final ethanol rinse, the liquid is removed by inverting the tube and blotting. Ethanol can be teased out of the tube with a pipette tip for more stringent applications. 20 to 30 microliters of acetic acid or other spreading solution is then added to the tube. The digested meristem tissue is rolled against the inside of the tube with a blunt dissecting probe to free the individual cells. The solution is stirred to distribute the cells. Tubes are returned to ice while the other samples are being processed. Because high humidity is required for spreading of the cell preparation, a humid chamber is prepared by spraying water on the paper towels lining the container. Paint stirring sticks are placed into the humid chamber to elevate the slides. Labeled slides are then placed onto the sticks. To drop the cells, they are first resuspended in the solution by gently tapping the tube or stirring with a pipette tip. 5 to 8 microliters of cells are taken from the top third of the liquid column and dropped directly onto the slide. Cells can also be dropped from a few millimeters to facilitate spreading. The humid chamber is then covered with a moist chem wipe until the slides are dry. The slides are cross-linked to prevent chromosome detachment. Slides can be stored for a few days at room temperature or at 4 degrees Celsius, although same-day hybridization is recommended for localization of small targets. The success of a digest, and therefore the hybridization itself, is determined by the morphology of the metaphase spreads on the slide. Samples of underdigestion through overdigestion will be presented. Severely underdigested cells have fully intact cell walls and retain their rectangular shape. Slides with this appearance should not be used for hybridization. In slides that are slightly more digested, the walls and membranes of peripheral cells begin to break down. While chromosomes are now visible, they are generally not accessible for hybridization and should only be used for extremely robust probes. While spreads are now readily visible, cytoplasm still surrounds the chromosomes and will appear as fluorescent background. The spread on the left is probably usable for visualizing large target probes, assuming the background level is acceptable for your application. Less cytoplasm surrounds these spreads, however some chromosomes may overlap each other. Sister chromatid separation is visible in the lower left spread, an indication that mitosis has resumed. The metaphase spreads in these panels are good for hybridization. Good spreads will have minimal cytoplasm, non-overlapping chromosomes, and the entire spread will fit in one image. As the spreads become over-digested, the distance between the chromosomes increases. Hybridization signals are still good, but multiple images must be combined to include the full chromosome set. When multiple images are required, some photo bleaching will occur during subsequent exposures. In this spread, all 20 chromosomes are present, 
but taking pictures of all of them is not usually worthwhile. Additionally, it cannot be ensured that all 20 chromosomes are from the same spread. As overdigestion becomes more severe, chromosomes can no longer be assigned to a specific metaphase spread, and the slide cannot be used. In extreme cases of overdigestion, aggregates of cytoplasm begin to form and cell boundaries become irregular and amorphous. As overdigestion proceeds, the aggregates become larger until eventually what remains is mostly debris. Being able to identify well-prepared spreads is of paramount importance when obtaining fish images. In most instances, increasing the digestion time after observing underdigested spreads and decreasing the digestion time after observing overdigested spreads will help obtain better results. Remember, however, that roots of different thickness will require different digestion times. Prepared probes must be hybridized to slides before they can be visualized. To begin, a water bath is preheated until near boiling. Slides to be hybridized are laid out on an elevated surface, such as the two sticks shown. Once the water is boiling, 8 microliters of fluorescent probe is pipetted onto each slide and covered with a plastic cover slip. An aluminum pan is layered with chem wipes and moistened with water to prevent slides from drying during the boiling process. Slides are placed either directly on the wet chem wipes or in a metal slide rack and covered with a plastic tray. While heat transfer is improved by placing slides directly into the pan, slide racks allow a larger number of slides to be processed at the same time. The pan and slides are placed into the boiling water bath and covered with aluminum foil to prevent evaporation. Slides are left in the boiling water for 5 minutes. While the slides are boiling, a humid chamber is prepared by placing chem wipes into an airtight container and spraying with water. After the slides have finished boiling, the pan is removed from the water bath. During this step, Care is taken to avoid steam burns, and the plastic lid is removed in a manner that prevents condensed water from dripping on the slides. The slides are transferred to the prepared humid chamber, and the chamber tightly closed. Plastic wrap may be used to ensure an airtight seal. The humid chamber, a coplin jar, and 50 milliliters of 2x SSC are then placed in a 55 degrees Celsius oven overnight. The next morning, a second Coplin jar is filled with room temperature 2x SSC and put next to the pre-warmed one, now filled with the warm 2x SSC. The slides are dipped into room temperature 2x SSC to remove the cover slip, then placed into the warmed 2x SSC for approximately 20 minutes. After washing, the slides are briefly shaken off and the backs padded dry on a chem wipe before being transferred to an elevated surface. A drop of mounting medium containing DAPI is placed on each slide and then covered with a glass cover slip. Plain mounting medium is used if a blue probe is in the hybridization cocktail. The slides are now ready to view. Given the wide selection of fluorescent microscopes on the market, it's best to learn to use the one available to you from someone in your laboratory or microscope facility. One secret to acquiring good images is learning to focus accurately. This series of through-focus centromere images is provided to help the novice recognize out-of-focus halo effects. After acquisition, most images benefit from image processing, even if only to add a scale bar. The next series of video clips will guide you through the basics of image processing using Adobe Photoshop. It is important to check image alignment. In this example, a shift occurred when the green probe image was acquired. To correct the problem, the green channel is selected while viewing all colors. After activating the Move tool, the right arrow key is used to precisely position the layer. 
In this case, proper alignment of the red and green 5S gene probes resulted in yellow signals. Save the aligned file. A reduction in background can be accomplished in several ways, one of which is with the Levels tool. Image adjustments should be performed in separate layers so they can be easily documented. Adjustment layers can be added by clicking the half-shaded circle in the Layers palette. A Levels Adjustment layer is added, which brings up the Levels window. The black point eyedropper is selected, which is used for sampling candidate black set points. The subtraction is based on the individual red, green, and blue values of the sampled pixel. Trying to remove all of the background may result in a loss of information, as can be seen on the lower left chromosomes. Other pixel locations must be sampled to find an acceptable level of background reduction. Some images benefit from adjusting the brightness and contrast. A brightness and contrast adjustment layer is added to bring up the brightness window, and adjustments are made. Individual adjustment layers are deselected to compare with the original image. The edited image is saved. Other probe images of the same spread can be added as additional layers to the original image. The standard Select All, Copy, and Paste procedures are utilized to introduce the new probe image. The blending mode is changed from Normal to Screen to see the combined image. Text is added by selecting the Type tool, choosing the font, size, and color, and then clicking on the image in the desired location. The text is entered and then accepted by clicking the relevant layer in the Layers palette or by pressing the Enter key. The Line tool is used to add arrows. The color and weight are selected and arrowheads added through the setting drop-down. Arrows are added to the image by clicking and dragging. Scale bars can be added if the number of pixels per micrometer has been determined for the magnification at which the image was acquired. Calibration slides can be purchased for this purpose. To insert a scale bar, a new file is created. The width is equal to the number of pixels in the length of the scale bar, and the height is equal to its thickness. The scale bar is inserted into the main image by using Select All, Copy, and then Paste. The bar is repositioned using the Move tool. The layered image is then saved as a separate file from the original image. Creating a karyotype is a relatively simple process. Layered images are first flattened to make the copying process easier. A new file is created at an appropriate size and at the same resolution as the original image. The original image is enlarged to make accurate tracing easier. The navigator window is used to move throughout the zoomed in image to find the desired chromosome. The lasso tool is selected and used to trace the outline of the chromosome. The tool is used by clicking and dragging completely around the chromosome before releasing. Tracing should be done slowly as mistakes can only be corrected by completely retracing the chromosome. A completed selection is indicated by flashing dashed lines. The chromosome can then be copied and pasted into the new karyotype file. The move tool is used to reposition the chromosome in the new file. The image is rotated by selecting the corner of the image, which will maintain its relative dimensions. The transformation is then accepted before the move tool is used to drag the chromosome to a new location. The chromosome is deselected in the original image by pressing Ctrl and the D key. The navigation window is used to locate the next chromosome for the karyotype. 
The same process is used to outline and copy each chromosome in the karyotype. Once the karyotype is completed, the layered file is saved. Thank you for spending time with us. We hope you've come away with the knowledge and confidence to tackle your fish project. Well, what are you waiting for? Go fishing! <laughs>